Hi everyone, uh, so my name's Sarah. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of York, um, and when they let me, I'm also part of the research team at Nexa. Um, and we're going to talk to you about data feminism, what is data feminism, why is data feminism, who are data feminists, and I hope at the end of this you'll, you'll put your hands up for that. Um, but first of all, we're going to actually ground it a bit, and in particular my partner in, in crime, um, in good trouble, uh, Lynn, who I'll let introduce herself, is going to ground it in a particular piece of work that she did called COVID Voices. So. Hi everyone and thank you for the opportunity to be here. So my name is Lynn Laidlaw and I'm a patient. I live with a rare autoimmune rheumatic disease. I'm a patient public contributor to research and I've done some work with, with Sarah and also um, I've had the opportunity to do some research working as a, as a peer researcher. So this was, this was the project COVID-19 Shielding Voices and it was a project uh, Co bit of co-produced qualitative research to understand the personal shielding experiences of people living with arthritis and musculoskeletal disease because I had to shield for that reason and I was involved in a lot of COVID research and it was mainly quant, it was a load of data and I remember being in a meeting and saying how can we bring this data to life because it just missed all the context and nuance around shielding and I was fed up being sent these quant surveys by organisations that asked me questions about my shielding experiences, but they never interrogated the issues that were important to me. And when I asked the organisation, have you actually involved anyone that was shielding in this? They invariably said, oh, well, you know, we made up the questionnaire and then we sent it to someone for, for, for an opinion, but, but, but we didn't change, but we didn't change anything. So, this, and I felt like a passive recipient, both of the shielding process, but also research into it. And, you know, we, we wanted to, so myself and another patient, Joyce, came up with the idea, and we teamed together with Charlotte Sharp, who's a, a clinical academic based in, based in Manchester. And co-production to us was working in equal partnership for, for equal benefit. So we worked with a flat hierarchy, although Charlotte was principal investigator and led the project, and we made collective d decisions. And the, the, um, the artwork that you see, the, see there, we, we invited as well as doing focus groups and interviews, we invited people to submit creative materials, which we didn't analyse, but just to be as inclusive as we could be. And, and we, we got the, just the most wonderful um, submissions from people which just added so much to the, to the research. Yeah. So, how does that link to data feminism? How does that make us data feminists? We're gonna pull back a little bit from that example. Um, we've already had the concept of uh, algorithmic bias introduced, but I'm gonna talk about a specific example of that. Um, in the very good <laughs> example set by the earlier speakers of dropping the F-bomb, uh, this is known as the fuck your algorithm protest, okay? This was A-level students during COVID, their A-levels had been cancelled and there was a decision to use an algorithm to predict their grades in place of, for example, their teachers providing that information. Now, the problem is that obviously you can link in data people's grades to things like what school they went to, was it a private school or was it a comprehensive, what postcode are they in, what is the socioeconomic status there. Basically it's a really good way to embed bias into that prediction, yeah? So this was the response against it saying don't do this, people who know us should do this. But I think it's worth saying that it's not just these, these big data sets, these big quantitative algorithms where this happens, where you see it in decision making. Um, another example I'm gonna give. Um, so this is ChatGPT, which if anyone was at the lightning talks, a surprisingly good poet, which is annoying. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it is my nemesis and I hate it. Um, and I'm gonna give you the reason why. So ChatGPT, again, it just uses, it scrapes data. Isn't that a horrible term? Um, it just collects all that data and reuses it. It's not reflecting, it's reproducing those things. So if we have a look, for example, at a question, in the sentence, the professor told the graduate student she wasn't working hard enough. Who wasn't working hard enough? Uh, you can see this example online from Margaret Mitchell, by the way. The pronoun she refers to the graduate student, therefore the graduate student is the one the professor believed wasn't working hard enough. You ask ChatGPT, 
In the sentence, the professor told the graduate student he wasn't working hard enough. Who wasn't working hard enough? The pronoun he refers to the professor. Therefore, the sentence implies that the professor was not working hard enough according to his own assessment. Look what happened there, okay? And this is not ChatGPT's fault. There is an awful problem in academia with a lack of diversity, with, with you know, an overabundance of stale male pale professors. But the point is that this doesn't discern from that. It doesn't reflect on it. I, I still hear suggestions such as, oh, wouldn't it be great to use these kind of these AIs, things like this, to make hiring decisions because they won't have any bias. It's completely the opposite, okay? They replicate this bias. And this is where data feminism has kind of emerged from. It's been a response to, um, it's part of that family of data justice approaches that we've heard about. It's a response to, to bias, to uh, the capacity for data to be misused in ways that kind of withhold, uphold, sorry, prejudice or assumptions or problems. Um, it is, so I'll, if you can read this, it's feminism as shorthand for the diverse and wide ranging projects that name and challenge sexism and other forces of oppression, which seek to create more just, equitable and livable futures. Um, it's deliberately, it's intersectional, so feminism it is about women's rights, and it's also about all of those other kind of aspects that you need to think about, about race, about poverty, about sexuality. Um, but it's fundamentally, it's about power, the imbalance of power, and how that can be challenged and changed. And this is what chimes with me and Lynn, when we do co-work, co-production, co-design, collaboration, Power is always in the room and it's the conversation we're not always having. It's the thing that we're reluctant to really talk about. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in, in terms of power, we hear, we hear the word empower, <laughs> empower empowerment, and it's just thrown around like confetti, isn't it? <laughs> but it's never, ever, but, but we never define it. What do we mean by that? You know, do people only have power? if others choose to, to, to empower them. Can we ever say that we've empowered people? And it, it, it's, you know, it's just, I think it's a word that, that we really need to be careful about, about using in these, because we hear it, I hear it a lot. I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm all powerful because so many people are empowering me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we're gonna use data feminism as a structure to talk through some of these issues that we've encountered. It's seven principles, seven kind of pillars. Um, we're gonna talk you through exactly what they are. Um, I'll give a, a kind of quick summary now, but fundamentally we want you to think this isn't about, so you know, I'm an academic and obviously you know the phrase, it's just academic, which is really hurtful by the way, please stop using that. Um, but I don't want this to just be abstract. We think this is a way of doing things, a way of being things, and that's what we're gonna try and convince you of today. Um, so, to talk you through what they mean though, as that initial quote said, they are fundamental, this is an approach fundamentally about power, recognising that in data, the data that is collected, that is used, that is reported, power is at play there and we need to both examine it and we need to challenge it, we need to be ready to challenge how that data is used, what we're going to ask you to think about as well is how we challenge ourselves in that space. Um, elevate emotion. This is, if anyone uh, knows kind of feminist scholarship and where that comes from, this is a kind of really classic one because it's about the idea that emotion gets um, sort of removed in the hierarchy of what's important. So the last talk was a brilliant example of why emotion needs to be elevated, why it's, it's so important. Um, but it also asks us to think about our own emotion. We are not dispassionate observers. We are not neutral when we look at and use data and we need to respect that. Rethink binaries is about moving past the kind of simplicity of, of duality, I guess. Stop, stop trying to put things in boxes because that hides a lot of the complexity. Also, where you have a binary, where you have groups, you usually have a hierarchy, okay? Power, again, is at play and we're gonna talk about how that looks. Uh, embrace pluralism. This is, the numbers do not speak for themselves and they do not have a single truth. We need to get past that idea and actually there need to be multiple perspectives and we need to welcome multiple perspectives to give a whole picture of data. And then the last, oh, not the last one, consider context. 
So hugely important to think about the context in which data is collected. What Again, what is that data missing? But also the context in which the choice about what is data gets made, what do we present as data? And then the last, again, a classic kind of from feminist background is make labor visible. There's always work and there's always people whose work is being neglected and ignored. Um, you guys probably know, you know the history. The original computers were women because it was a job that wasn't prestigious and men were happy for them to just do all of the kind of calculations. Um, and it's only because people, so if you've seen the film or read the book Hidden Figures, that's about recognizing the labor that was performed by women, African-American women, case, and elevating that and making that visible. And that's something that you try and do if you're thinking like a feminist. So a reminder though, this isn't just about data feminism over here, and how abstract it is. We want you to think about being a data feminist and how that's affected the way we work. So, we're gonna kick off. First one, examine power. <laughs> um, now, this is from, uh, I did a fellowship for the NHR, which is kind of the research wing of the NHS. Um, I did a fellowship on something called learning health systems, which is the idea that all of the data that's collected in healthcare settings, we should actually analyze that, use that to do improvement cycles, um, it, it, use that to yeah, identify where to make improvements and evaluate them, and that is called a learning health system. That's that concept. And my fellowship was about, so I called it, what would it be, a patient-centered learning health system? What would that look like? And I was very pleased with myself for coming up with that. Um, a point I'm gonna make here is that there is no mistake or assumption that I'm gonna name that I haven't made. I'm not here to kind of lecture you on that. I know where you're coming from. I made that choice. I called it the patient-centered learning health system. And immediately, I then worked with public contributors who are people with lived experience of health services, have their own, live with conditions, or are carers. They immediately said, no, we don't like it, <laughs> which is upsetting. But they said essentially, because, and, and this is the key point, they said, can you, you know, who is active and who is passive in the phrase putting patients in the center? Why do you get to choose where to put me? Okay, where is power at playing that? We ended up renaming the project. They wanted it to be called the patient driven learning health system, and they wanted that in opposition to the data driven learning health system, actually. But we see here how just the words that we use that sound really nice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give patients a voice, that's another one. And yet we never acknowledge perhaps what does that mean about how we were neglecting their voice previously or not letting their voice be heard. And I know Lynn has a huge experience of this. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's a concept that's really difficult to push back against. What do you mean you don't like that? <laughs> I'm putting you at the centre of, of this, like there is some identical patient or person that we can put in the centre and the um, organisations know how to meet their needs. And, and, and it's, just not, it's just not like that. And I really felt with, with, with COVID voices that, oh, and this sounds a bit kind of, you know, for the first time really in research, I had a bit of power because I was a co-investigator, a co-researcher, so I was also taking the responsibility. So there was things that we could do with the project, like the creative materials, like feeding back the results to the participants in, a, in our research. And you know, we've got a policy report coming out in September, we're, we're nearly ready to submit a paper. And even though our research ended last year, I have kept the responsibility of keeping in touch with our participants to do that kind of thing. like offering some payment to people for their time to participate in our research. Having a patient advisory group, you know, it wasn't just enough that there was two patients doing the research. And just all those things for the first time, because we had this flat hierarchy and we're making these collective decisions, we had the power to really do the research the way that, the way that felt right to me and the way that had really, because I participate in research as well, the, the way that it just felt wrong to me before. Yeah, and I think this illustrates that. So if you compare all the ways that Lynn just talked about being involved to the idea of being trapped in the center where someone's put you while everything happens around you, that's how power is kind of manifesting. We're doing it for you, but we're not doing it with you. The phrase that, again, a patient came up with, am I at the table or am I on the menu? That's something to bear in mind. Okay, principle two, elevate emotion. 
sticking with the same project again. So I was talking about learning health systems, talking about health data, you know, how would you guys want to get involved in the improvements? The patients again wanted to go back. They said, hang on a minute, what is, what's data? What counts as data? What gets counted as data? And they kept talking about, they kept using the phrase messy data. They were like, you know, this is going to become either just like a, an experience survey, <coughs> friends and family test, that's just a kind of yes, no about this complexity. Or are you going to look at the symptoms that matter to me? Are you going to look at recovery times that matter to me? Who gets to define that? And emotion and relationships were hugely important within that. And they kind of said, we don't want, for example, recovery just to be defined by did I get out in two weeks? I want to know how I felt. Did I felt I was taken care of? Did I feel confident then to go home and do these things by myself? Who's going to actually look at that stuff? And I think what's so important is that they made this argument beautifully that if you're not looking at that, if you're neglecting emotion, you're missing a huge part of the picture. You are missing out on something that is fundamental, that is necessary data, meaningful data. And again, I think COVID Voices has a brilliant example yeah, of this. So we, um, when we, you know, we, we had our, our focus groups and our, um, our interview data, and you know, we, we were doing the doing the analysis, and one thing that came out really strongly was was emotions. And then we, you know, we were trying to think, right, you know, how how do we how do we deal with with this? How, how do we present this? Because I didn't, and you know, I I was I was. I, I just I found that I couldn't get away from the data. It was running through my head all the time, and I just felt it was a great responsibility to represent it in a way that had meaning for, for the people th that had spoken to us. And in the end, we um, we, we used a, a Corbin and Strauss theory, which goes back to the 80s. Three lines of work, you know, managing chronic illness at home, and they talk about practical work, the work, life work, the work that we do every day, illness work for people living with conditions and biographical work, you know, your place in the world. And we added this extra line of work, which was emotional work. And I felt that, we felt that framing it as work added legitimacy, because it wasn't just a bunch of people being emotional. You know, managing the emotions around shielding was hard work, and we really wanted to, to reflect that. And I think also bearing in mind that the majority of people living with autoimmune rheumatic diseases are women. So, so that, that was an added dimension as, as well. And, and, I, did, you know, and, and I think we, we talk a lot about burden. I hate the word burden. Who's the burden? Am I the burden? <laughs> you know, whose bur who's burden is it anyway? <laughs> and so, yeah, work can be burdensome. But, you know, and why do we talk about burden for patients but work for clinicians? Or, or, or professionals or whatever and it was just really important to us to present the emotions around people's shielding experiences as work because that's where it was. Yeah. Okay, the next principle, embrace pluralism. Um, so I said on the last slide, it was kind of that, the question I got asked, who gets to decide what's data? Who gets to have that say? And the word Lynn's mentioned, legitimacy, is really important here. Who has the legitimate voice to declare that something is data and it's correct or appropriate. And this is an example from, again, staying in digital health, the idea of electronic patient records, um, which get heralded as kind of a great solution when there's about a million problems to solve before we get there. But the, co the, the question of what goes into that record is really important, because will it just be what the professionals think? And even in that, professionals don't always think the same thing. Uh, a question that patients had was, well, my GP and my consultant disagree about my diagnosis. What goes in the record? But particularly, it's about looking for, is there an opportunity in something like that to deliberately embrace that pluralism to say, what, is the, what matters to patients? What's the stuff that for them is their priority or the outcome that is most important? And can we then build that into the system in a way that says this is real and important as well? And the other aspect there in Embrace Pluralism is to recognize, therefore, that quite a lot of the time, as professionals, as researchers, it is our voice that gets treated as legitimate. It's our interpretation. And we really need to be more reflexive, reflective about do we get to say we know the truth about someone else, or do we need to actually welcome their interpretations in? 
Yeah, and, and I think you know, we've heard a lot about reflection today, but I think reflexivity, which is acknowledging how prior experiences, assumptions and beliefs influence how we think and feel, is crucial in all research. And it's, it's most often, um, we think about it when we think about qualitative research, but, but I would say we need it for all types of, of research that, that we're doing. And, and I think for me, you know, going into this project as someone that was shielding, I had to be very reflexive. To a certain extent, I could switch it off once I'd started, which became a bit of a problem. But, you know, would I only recognise, you know, when I was speaking to people, when I was analysing the interviews, would I only recognise themes that chimed with me and my personal experience? And that's why it was really important to be aware of my biases, my assumptions throughout, throughout the project as well. Our next point is consider context. And this very much relates to embrace pluralism in the sense of, of what do we consider data and what's real. And I, as, I, as we were putting this together, I kind of thought I'm giving you a lot of negative examples of things done wrong. And I wanted to highlight that here's an example, I think, of doing this right, where this is something called the patient experience library. So this is about saying that, do you know what? patient experiences in the form of surveys, stories, academic research, opinion pieces, uh, you know, care commission kind of reviews, that matters and is important. We can elevate that into the format of it's a library, it's a thing, it's a source of data that you should consult and review and read from. And I think that's acknowledging this, consider context is one acknowledging that those experiences are the context a lot of the time, or to understand those experiences, you need to recognize the context in which this happens, and that's about the lived experience of it. But it's also that consider context of consider who, get, who chooses what data matters, and the choice has been made here to say that experience matters. It needs to be uh, platformed, treated as valid and valuable data. It also, it needs to then be accessible to the people it's about. They need to be able to find it and use it themselves. So I think choices have been made there that really support that and elevate that. Yeah, and I think context is all important. You know, so I've heard Chris Whitty say, oh, shielding was bad for mental health, because that's what the data shows. Okay, why was it bad for data? For, for mental health. Where was the context and nuance? And, and what we found was, actually it wasn't shielding. People felt protected. It was Freedom Day that was really bad for people's mental health. Because they went from protected to being thrown to the wolves, as one of our participants said. So it's that context is really important. And people that shielded the extremely clinical vulnerable, we weren't a homogeneous group. You know, there was this like kind of concept that we were all ready to short, shuffle off our mortal coil, so it didn't really matter anyway. You know, because we're half, half dead, but you know, the context for people in our research, you know, did they have children at school? You know, with people moving out of the family home so that their children could continue to go to school? Did they go to work? You know, could they continue to work from home once formal shielding ended? You know, wh wh what was their cultural context? Did, did they live in, in um, multi generational households? And all that was so important to our research and it was something that data just didn't capture at, at, at all, that, that was just totally missing. Hmm. So I'm moving on to challenge power um, and I will explain this and I want to, there's a slight pivot here now that I want to bring it, as I said, this is partly about reflect, so we've talked about reflexivity, this is about reflecting on ourselves and our position because often when we talk about power, the thing we do, we talk about those people in power over there. Okay, so I'm, I'm an academic, there are tons of academics who would say, you know, oh, my job is I speak truth to power. And I do wonder how many kind of people in power read the Journal of Health, Social Research and Policy and things like that. So I, I have a little issue with that already about getting information out. But there's, I think you need to pivot that and go, when am I the person in power? When am I the person that is getting to make a decision or has a platform or has a privilege, a legitimacy? And that's what this concept is about. And this is called epistemic injustice. So ep epistemic just means relating to knowledge. And injustice, I think, is the key word. I really struggle sometimes with whether to bring this out because I feel like it is that very abstract, hi, I'm an academic, I've pulled kind of a concept off a shelf for you. But I think the word injustice is really crucial here. What it means is certain types of knowledge or ways of knowing get delegitimized, get neglected. For example, emotion. The emotions don't matter. We're going to look at this, this hard data, and it's hard data because we've decided it's more important. 
or it means that people get deplatformed almost as a type of knower. So a classic one here is patients versus professionals. Um, in, in academia, we really value people called clinical academics. We mentioned Charlotte Sharp, who's wonderful. And we recognize that these are people who live in two worlds and they bring immense insight. And yet I'll say, but what about this patient? And I go, oh, well, I, I spoke to them, they were quite biased. And I just think, wh why is it insight when it comes from a professional and it's bias when it comes from a patient? And the reason is power. The reason is privilege. And if we are not aware of the potential for epistemic injustice, then we can neglect what matters to people. We can neglect them. We can put ourselves in a little silo about our own views. And uh, this is, it, it's, it's a comment that's been made by patients for many years, but um, Trish Greenhall, who so I'm sure you'll know if any of you work in health, um, the, the comment, the doctor says, don't confuse your Google search with my six years at medical school. And the patient says, don't confuse the one hour lecture you had on my condition with my 20 years of living with it. Okay, these are expertise. Both of these things are expertise is one of the points I make. We elevate emotion. At this point, I sometimes see when I'm doing this at a medical conference, you can see some people getting a little bit, the heckles rise a little bit. You know, I studied hard, I worked really hard. And you did, and you're brilliant but you're not enough on your own. And we try and embody that right now. We're both here talking to you. We think it takes both. And we think that that challenging ourselves to go, when are we not enough? And when do we need to invite other people or say, I'm, I'm only half the story is really important. Yeah, and I think the COVID voice is what we wanted. To, you know, we wanted to be academically rigorous and, and methodologically rigorous. And part of that was because I, we didn't want to be seen as a bunch of amateurs playing at being researchers. But when we, um, when we had a celebration event w with our participants and we, um, we evaluated that, one of the comments came back was, you know, this is so great. You were academically rigorous, but you were full of emotions and care. And, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And, and I think this, th this whole thing about, you know, like um, Trisha's tweet there, you know, a lot of the time we are, you know, as a patient, I'm invited to share decisions, to self-manage, to take responsibility, but as long as I do it in the way that professionals want me to. You know, they advise and put options on the table, and my job is just to choose from one of the options that's presented to me. But what if I want to do my own research? What if I want to bring options to the table to discuss? Is this, is, is this allowed? And, yeah, I think the power is, yeah. <laughs> okay, rethink binaries, and I'm going to stick with the idea of, of, of push, you know, questioning ourselves a little bit. So, um, I mentioned then that, so that's a binary, patient and professional, expert and lay, okay? Um, and what's interesting, when I do talks like this and I say, oh yeah, co-production is great, I, inevitably, there will be someone here who wants to ask me, oh, I, I definitely want to do that, but how do I get to the real people? You know, how do I get to the real patients? Very, very valid in terms of, yes, we need more diversity. We need to go out to people and find them and involve them. But what we showed, um, we did some research on this, is that that question of, is this person representative of the group I want to reach? That only happens when the patient disagrees, okay? They are the patient voice at the point that they're agreeing with us. And when they don't, we suddenly become very kind of picky about, well, actually, I just think they're very, God forbid they have strong feelings about certain things, you know, and come along. We don't want to listen to them. And we gave it, obviously, a very academic name. We called it the confirmation logic. And actually, it's just beautifully summed up by uh, Rachel Rowan Olive, who's a service user, survivor, researcher, where she talks about, you know, I love co-producing the bits of your ideas that I agreed with anyway. That is the problem that we need to avoid. And it comes from that binary of actually, you are either the right kind of patient or the wrong kind of patient. And it, makes, it exposes our assumptions about apparently if you are intelligent, if you have different experiences, if you want to draw on, say, a professional experience as well as a personal one, we want to carve you up and say you are no longer the right kind of patient. So I think to recognize that actually patients are a hugely diverse group, that they are on a continuum of different experiences. That is what's going to bring, I think, really valuable people in. And we need to be mindful of how we play these games, these power games of deciding they're not right, they're, they're not right at the point they tell us we're wrong. That's something to be aware of. Yeah, and, you know, I, 
I've been involved in research for about mm, eight years now, and it didn't take me very long to, to understand that, that actually, as a public contributor to research, I had to be like Goldilocks porridge and just write. But actually, I had no control or say over what just right is. So on the one hand, it was like, um, you know, oh, you're, you're too knowledgeable, or, you know, like, like knowledge is a cure for the conditions that, that I live with. It, you know, it, it's absolutely, it's absolutely not. And, and on the one hand, oh no, you're far too knowledgeable. On the other hand, yeah. So if you want to access this opportunity, Lynn, if you could submit a CV or a two-page application and then come to an interview with three people interrogating you for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, it's crazy. There's absolutely, and it's that, um, you know, it comes the idea that people are hard to reach and stuff that comes up. So often with academics, there will be this kind of, okay, so we had a, we had a co-production meeting, it was on the university campus, there was an agenda, it was during working hours, we did not provide any costs. And for some reason, I only get these retired middle-class professionals <laughs> turning up. And it's kind of, well, no shit, Sherlock, you need to do something different. And the fact that we get to attribute that as their quality, they become the wrong kind of patient. As the to usual that, suspect. Yes, as opposed to the fact that we are not doing the work to go out and find people. That again is power at play. So, make labour visible. Um, some of you probably know this is a great short film called Uninvited Guests. This is about, uh, <laughs> Lynn's already mentioned how often she's empowered by self-help and self-management and things like that. This is a short film about the idea of various smart technologies that get introduced into this person's home. So here you're getting a text saying, are you using the smart fork? I'm not getting my updates. And the idea is, it, this is called photomation. And it's the idea of when something gets automated, but actually all it does is pass burden and work onto the end user, okay? If you've tried to, um, I apologize to anyone who works in primary care, but if you've tried to kind of book your online appointment through a system because it's quicker, you probably know that feeling of, well, this has just made my life harder. This hasn't automated anything. And it's fascinating because there is, there's a model in uh, health research called the burden of treatment theory. And it asks us to think about how often the hoops we want people to jump through for the treatment are as laborious as the living with the illness. You know, change your diet, change this, remember this appointment, remember this medication, but not on this day when you also take that medication. It's, it's work. And as Lynn said, the interesting thing there is why is it called burden when it's on people? Why don't we recognize the work we need to make labor visible? And what's interesting is I, when I was doing these slides, I picked out this particular, um, this particular quote that's from a blog that Lynn wrote about, the, and I was going to say, you know, this is about the burden we put on people that, of the labor of getting in the room with us. You know, again, we sit there and go, well, I'm just not having the right kind of patience. People have to work so hard to get into the room with us to do co-production, to do co-design. And so I picked this out, and again, I'm going back to that point of, I'm not, I'm not critiquing anyone for any mistake I haven't made myself, and I made it again here. I think I said, oh, it's about burden, isn't it? And Lynn, I think, had a different take. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, I think often people decide what my burden is. Oh, I don't want to burden you with that, Lynn. Or I can't ask you to do that, you know, because that's too burdensome. Well, let me decide. You know, ask me if I would like to be involved in this. Ask me if I've got time to commit to it. But don't make the decision for me, but I, I think, you know, w w when I wrote this blog, it, it was like, you know, just pushing back against the idea that somehow involvement just happens, you know, so, somehow you're just kind of found, but you had put a lot of work into being involved yeah. <laughs> and making, making the connections, yeah. So, they're the... They're the principles we've taken you through, and I hope you can see they, they, we, we like them because they chime so much with what we've gone. I could spot every one of them and go, oh, I see that happening. I see that happening in my work. And it's all about, as you say, it's do we recognize people as equal? Do we share legitimacy? Do we make assumptions? And we need to not just think of that as that problem in, in those big data sets, those big quantitative data sets. This can happen at any scale of study, qualitative or quantitative, where we are researchers doing things about people. And we need to be mindful and we need to challenge ourselves to not work that way. And, you know, we started off with that point of don't put patients in the center. Um, 
don't put data feminism in the center and just escalate around it. It's a cheesy point, it played better previously. Um, don't do that. I really genuinely hope that you can think, actually, I, I'm a data feminist. I care about these things. I can see how these things apply to my work. That's what I hope you can take away. Yeah, and just, you know, I, I would say a lot of this is about being reflexive. It's about being curious, thinking a little deeper, but also being honest and transparent about when you don't or, or when you can't. And, you know, when I think of data, I think I'm more than a data point, and don't ever forget that. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah and Lynn. I told you this was going to be a good one, isn't it? It's like mind <laughs> Um, great. Any questions, please, from the room? Let me check on the live stream as well. Let's go in the room first. Yes, let me jump up here. Um, yeah, really enjoyed that. Um, you made, you illustrated really well the risk of using AI and the bias that um, it can attribute. Do you see AI and its power being able to be harnessed in order to use the qualitative data better? Because um, I think the reason we find it easier to use the boxes than qualitative is the time it takes to summarise and take the key points. I wondered if that's something that has been explored. I, I, I can't say I've explored it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very transparent. I hate this whole conversation about AI and I get really heads up about it because I feel like it, it, we focus on this potential use of it and the actual harms of it are so, and are so visible. I think it's interesting the thing about can it save us time. I, I saw someone say that chat GPT saves you time if you don't care how good something is. And I think we care about doing good analysis and doing that right, and, and, but you're right that that's time consuming. Um, I do also, just because you said the word, that's another terrible phrase, harness the power of patience. I've heard that one before. Who do you harness? You don't harness people, that's dreadful. Um, I don't know if Lynn has more nuanced thoughts on AI than me, I do apologize. I mean, so I'm, yeah, I'm involved in a, a couple of things with AI. I mean, I think with, with qualitative, data, I kind of felt I almost had to submerge myself into it, it, it you know, to really, I, I think I have this, this thing because I participated in a lot of qualitative research, you know, do we, you know, we, we do these interviews and we get the transcripts and then we take them away and we make sense of them in, in a way that makes sense to, to us or, or, or to researchers and using theories that, 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 that people haven't been involved in. In, in, in coming in coming up with and and actually you know that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do the celebration event was you know to present the findings does this resonate with you did we understand what what you told us and and, and I and I just yeah the, the thought that the AI could kind of take that take that over and I think what we did was it was the the multiple different perspectives in in the qualitative analysis mm -hmm. which was which is really important. But on the other hand, because I've got a rare disease, I, I can see the utility for, for AI, you know, in, in, in things like, like, like rare disease, if you can get rid of the, the kind of statistical noise, I think they, they call it. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> uh, next, next question. Mine is not so much of a question as an observation over this conference because there have been several talks that have threads that have all come together, and this seems to have summarised quite a lot. Now, whenever there's a group of people, a group of patients, or anything, or anywhere where a service is being consulted, how is the outreach? I mean, do people search the, the demography of the area to say, well, who, who have we got to reach out to, and how are we, how are we going to do it? I mean, certainly earlier on, some, somebody quite rightly said in some areas, some people's communication is purely oral. So even sending correspondence in their own language is not going to do any good. That I do know, because one of my neighbours told me that a few years back. But certainly, 
when people do the outreach, who are they reaching out to? So who are these patients? Who are these service users, if you like? And who do they miss? And it's like with the consultation meetings. It's all right saying the more affluent, who maybe the more educated, the more literate, the more accessible. They get the information they know. Who does not turn up? And it's the people not in the room who are most important because there are these people who are not connected maybe through digital illiteracy, maybe caring responsibilities, lack of finance, I can't get there. Nobody seems to put them on the list anyway. And this is where, if we're not careful, we get the inverse care law. And the ones who are already getting the care get the say and get more. And the ones who need it the most within maybe the impoverished, the more socially disadvantaged are going lower and lower down. So I have seen over the whole of this day threads that have added up to those at multiple disadvantage, and this has summarised it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time? For, I think time for one more question, if anyone has one. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I think. I can't fault any point that you raised about the issues with healthcare and how, because I don't know if anyone was at my talk, I am a doctor. I had to like step back and not feel personally attacked by, <laughs> by you pointing out all of those things. But the thing that really stood out to me is about how oftentimes patients who do disagree with the suggestions we make are labelled as difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And then also to second that point there, um, it's, it's almost like when, say, I see a patient that looks like me that is going through an experience that I think is totally unfair and not right, um, it makes me now question the language that's used about speaking up when my colleagues are being totally inappropriate. And I'm not afraid to be difficult and be that person in the room to say, hey, you shouldn't say that. Um, and the thing that I most commonly see and have seen, unfortunately, are black people who are affected by, say, sickle cell disease, are accused yeah. of faking their pain, drug seekers, and all of that. Yeah. And I understand, in terms of the demographics of the researchers who would be doing that, uh, doing the research, reaching out to patients to do discovery about these diseases, they are less likely to be the black people who are affected by the condition. How do you actually tap into those communities and what effort is being made to shift the focus? Um, I don't want to say shift the focus, to broaden the net, I guess, in terms yeah. of the things that we're looking at and the things that have been deprioritized. How do we push those up the ranks? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think, I think what's, what, what's happened, you know, I think we know that, that actually to... Um, to involve different communities, you, you need to go out into those communities. And, and as Sarah said, you know, a lot, a lot of this is happening. Come, you know, we are expected as patients to go into people's world. There is nothing in my previous life prepared me for the things that I'm doing now. And I have learned how to operate mm. in, that, in, in that world. And we know that we need to go out into communities. The problem is, and I think someone, another speaker alluded to that is, you know, that's not quick. That takes time, that takes resources. It takes actually going in and building relationships first. You know, there's this um, thing about, you know, helicoptering. You helicopter in, you extract people's lived experience and then you bugger off. Mm -hmm. Again, and, and what, what does that do to, to trust? So we know, we know what the issues are. What no one has done so far on scale is put time and resources into overcoming them. I'm easy to engage. I, 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 I absolutely understand that. Yeah. I think I, one thing I'd signpost on that, just if I've got time, is that a piece of work we did with um, NHR, the Race Equality Public Action Group, and it was all about kind of we need to speak to people um, from uh, black and African Caribbean heritage communities about why they don't become involved in research. And initially the framing was all this like, maybe they just don't know how great it is kind of thing. So maybe it's a knowledge deficit. And actually what we encountered when we, so we went to communities and spoke to them is huge anger 
and betrayal of, well, you never wanted us before. The title of the report is actually, you've ignored our needs, but now you want our involvement. And also the point of, we've seen you before. You come here, you talk to me, and you go away, and I never see you again. So reciprocity, which has been mentioned today. And again, but unfortunately, none of that is new. So there is a thing that we need to reflect on ourselves. Why are we not learning these lessons? I think that's where thinking about power and privilege and trying to really challenge ourselves needs to come into it because actually we do know some of the ways to tackle this, but we've built up all of these defences to stop ourselves engaging with that activity. And I think unfortunately EDI has turned into, you know, like I've heard public, patient public involvement leads, you know, research is coming to them, find me someone that exhibits X, Y, Z characteristics to involve in my research, you know, and by the way, it's been submitted in two days' time. It's been operationalised, unfortunately, yeah. yeah so Please show your appreciation for Sarah.